Welcome to Grace Church. This is the fourth Sunday of Lent. We come to worship our King who indeed is all glorious above. And it is in this season we want to take space and time to contemplate His glory, His holiness, His perfection, and understand more deeply that in the light of that, that we are very much broken and that we are very much marred by sin. We are not doing this to bring ourselves to shame or to take pride in shame, but to prepare our hearts for the joy of Easter and to remember that we need a Savior and that God provided one in His only Son, Jesus Christ. Today, we will be celebrating communion after the sermon, so please gather your elements of bread and the fruit of the vine for later, and let's hear our call to worship from Psalm 84, verses 1 to 4. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty! My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Dear Father God, we thank you that we can come before you today to worship you as our loving Heavenly Father. We quiet our hearts now and come into your presence, knowing that you hear us and love us more than we can imagine. Your word tells us that from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. Your word also tells us that as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. Your word tells us that you redeem our life from the pit and crown us with love and compassion. And so we are reminded countless times that your love is eternal and abundant, that you rescue us from sin, redeem us from a pit of despair when we call out to you, and shower us with your love and understanding. We thank you for all that you do for us every day. We come to you on this Communion Sunday, remembering the price that Jesus paid for our sins. He laid down his life for each one of us, the just for the unjust, so that we could have abundant and eternal life when we embrace him as our Lord and Savior. Help us to remember with fresh eyes the price Jesus paid for our sins. His love redeems us, and it sets us free. We ask that you would be very present this morning, Lord, and we welcome you. Open every heart to hear the personal message you have for each one of us. Be with Pastor Alvin as he shares your word with us, and help us to not merely hear your word, but spur us on to put it into action in our lives and bear much fruit for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
A big hello to families and kids this morning. I'm gonna give a five second countdown to gather up all the kids for the family time message. Five, four, three, two, one. Hi boys and girls. How are you? I hope you're doing well. Um, I wanted to ask you, boys and girls, a question, and please don't go to your parents, okay? Try and see if you can figure it out yourself. Can you tell me which are the smallest bones in your human body? Tell me which is it. Can you guess? Well, you got it. The smallest bones in your human body are actually found in your ears. Yes, that's right. And guess what? Although we don't see this penny a lot these days, but they're actually the size of this penny. Yes. Isn't that crazy? The three smallest bones in your body, which are found in your ears, are the size of this penny. So I have a picture for you here. These are the three small bones, the hammer, the anvil, and the syrup, which are found in your ear. And the ear is a fascinating creation of God. It's so amazing because we can hear with our ears, but we use our ears also for balance. And believe it or not, but we actually use our ears for taste. So these ears, they work even when we're fast asleep. They never stop working. You know, I'll let you know how the ear works. Your ears work by capturing sound waves that comes from the outside into the outer part of your ears, which is called the pinna. This is the part that you can see. That's the part where the sound waves travel. And these sound waves funnel down into the middle part of your ear where they turn into vibrations and then they travel to the eardrum. From there, they flow into the Coachella, which is located in the inner part of your ears. Next, those sound waves finally go to the brain, which puts everything together and tells you what you're gonna hear. That's so cool, right? So your hearing is a gift from God to you. But what you choose to do with what you hear is your gift back to God. In fact, the Bible says this in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. I'm going to take it from my Bible. Everyone who hears these things, I say and obeys them is like a wise man. The wise man built his house on a rock. It rained hard and the water rose. The winds blew and hit that house, but the house did not fall because the house was built on a rock. But the person who hears the things I teach and does not obey them 
is like the foolish man. The foolish man built his house on sand. It rained hard and the water rose and the winds blew and hit that house and the house fell and came down a big crash. Well, don't let your life cra come crashing down like the foolish man. Listen to God. Well, how do we listen to God? Well, one way that we can listen to God is to read his word, the Bible, right? And the other way that we can listen to God is by listening to what others teach, which can be your Sunday school teacher or your pastor. And another way that God speaks to us is through the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit. He, he reminds us every day of what God has told us, right? So I hope that you will choose to listen to God with your ears and choose to give God back a gift by obeying what he has told you and what you have learned. Let's pray. Lord, help me hear what your word teaches and then give me the strength and the bravery to do what it says. Amen. Thank you, Gavina. Uh, that is so cool to think about how the brain works, how God has wired us. That's really, really neat. Uh, so some announcements for this week. Uh, there are a number that I do want to draw to your attention. Uh, the first one is that we are looking forward to seeing you live on April 3rd. I know that we've been in person for a little while now, uh, but April 3rd is kind of our kickstart, and we're really, really happy uh, to, to announce this and to look forward to that time where uh, we'll, we'll be together again. So we'll be moving to record our Sunday live worship on that day and to have it available for those at home by 1 p.m. So that's going to be a big shift. And so, so instead of joining us at 10 p.m. like today, uh, it's going to be shifted as it is live recorded at 10 a.m. here, it'll be then uh, put online by 1 p.m. So starting on April 3rd, it'll be available at 1 p.m. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, why? Now, this is to be able to offer to those both in person and online a fullness of our worship service. So up to this point, the online pre-recorded service had all the elements of our worship service, while when we gathered together in person, uh, we had to simplify things due to restrictions and protocols and things like that. But now that we're reopening, we can do, uh, we can do more, and so uh, we just wanted to simplify things that way and streamline it. We're also going to be starting uh, on April 3rd in-person kids ministries as well, and so we do want to let families know about that. And there are a number of things that we do need uh, volunteers for that uh, are on our, our scrolling announcement page at the beginning of the service. So uh, if you need to, after the service is done, you can go right back to the beginning and take a look at those announcements that are scrolling. But I'll bring your attention to this, that we do have a need for a treasurer for the church. And so if this is a skill set that you, that you have and a gifting that you have, please do contact us. Uh, we are also looking for those who are passionate about worshiping. Uh, worshiping God and those who, who uh, play musical instruments. And so if you'd like to um, uh, see if maybe this is a good fit uh, to, to offer your gifts and abilities in worship as well and for the worship team and part of the worship team um, like Gus and Jess and, and Diane, uh, then you can also get in touch with Don Bartlett as well. And lastly, it's, it's, uh, if you are open to volunteering with Kids Ministries, we do have a need there also. Uh, so if you are um, called to that, if you love children uh, and you have a desire to see them uh, grow closer to the Lord, then please do speak to Thanu about that opportunity as well. Now, you might be thinking in terms of masking practices, what are we doing now that the church and now that the province has uh, reopened? So Grace Church has taken a stance of keeping in line with the provin provincial and city mandates and protocols. But out of a concern of loving our brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, we'll be keeping the necessity of masking indoors as a protocol for our church until May the 1st, at which point session will take a look at the provincial and city mandates and then act accordingly from that time. And so just for this, uh, just a brief time, we'll, we'll forbear with it and, you know, we'll be patient with it and uh, we'll do that so that we can ensure the safety of each other as well. 
Uh, I do want to thank you, Grace members, for serving the church by casting your votes for our slate of new elders, and I'm just so happy to say that, that all of them have been accepted and will be holding a service in April where we will induct our new elders officially uh, in, in, their, uh, in, the, in the service. Uh, and also on screen here, we are having an outreach to our neighborhood children, uh, an Easter outreach that Thanu is planning. And so donations do need to be in by today, April 3rd, uh, sorry, by next week, April 3rd. And so on the screen, you have some uh, suggested candies, but whatever you do get for the kids, it does need to be nut free. And most of all, if you could just pray for this event, uh, I know we're just handing out candies and like connecting with families, but but that's the thing, is connecting with the families. And so if you could ask that the Lord would just continue to use this to strengthen and deepen our relationships, uh, that's the most important part. Now let's hear our first reading for today. Psalm 15. Lord, who can live in your sacred tent? Who can stay on your holy mountain? Anyone who lives without blame and does what is right. They speak the truth from their heart. They don't tell lies about other people. They don't do wrong to their neighbors, and they don't say anything bad about them. They hate evil people, but they honor those who have respect for the Lord. They keep their promises even when it hurts. They do not change their mind. They lend their money to poor people without charging interest. They don't accept money to harm those who aren't guilty. Anyone who lives like that will always be secure. as my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this I Jesus, for he 
has said that he will bring me home and day by day I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne to this I hold Let's pray together. Holy God, in our day-to-day lives, in our busyness, we are too easily unaffected by the sacrifice you made to redeem us. But it does, in fact, matter in our moment-to-moment experiences because you redeemed us. You paid the price for us so that we would live out our Easter reality of Christ in us, the hope of glory, free from the bondage to the power of sin in our lives. And so, God, we come before you and we ask that you would forgive us when we don't live this reality out in our lives, when we cut corners at work and in our relationships, when we are not walking in spirit-empowered integrity. Forgive us for not holding our tongues and instead we speak with slander. Forgive us for keeping a tight fist on our money when all that we own is truly yours. And so, Father, we ask for your forgiveness for these things. And we take a quiet moment now to confess those sins that the Holy Spirit is also bringing to mind at this time. Father, thank you for your grace. And it is your grace that leads us back to you. It is because your grace and love that you reveal our sin to us, that you discipline us, that you bring us back in step with you. Thank you that when we confess our sins, you are faithful and just. You forgive us our sins. You purify us from all unrighteousness. And so we thank you for your grace and mercy, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our second reading today comes from Micah chapter 6, verses 6 to 16. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Listen, The Lord is calling to the city, and to fear his name is wisdom. Heed the rod and the one who appointed it. Am I still to forget your ill-gotten treasures, you wicked house, and the short ephah, which is accursed? Shall I acquit someone with dishonest scales, with a bag of false weights? Your rich people are violent, your inhabitants are liars, and their tongues speak deceitfully. Therefore, I have begun to destroy you, to ruin you because of your sins. You will eat, but not be satisfied. Your stomach will still be empty. You will store up, but save nothing, because what you save I will give to the sword. You will plant, but not harvest. You will press olives, but not use the oil. You will crush grapes, but not drink the wine. You have observed the statutes of Omri, 
and all the practices of Ahab's house. You have followed their traditions. Therefore, I will give you over to ruin and your people to derision. You will bear the scorn of the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, uh, we come to you and, and uh, we hear messages like this. We hear, we read, and uh, there is a part of us that maybe wants to turn off. But Father, we ask that you would give us ears that hear, that you would help us to humble ourselves before you, that we would truly hear what you have for us. So speak to us today. Give us ears that truly hear, eyes that truly see. Uh, and so, Father, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart may, ple- may be pleasing and acceptable to you, God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So God had this prophetic message through Micah. His people were not following him. In chapter 1, we read about how God has a holy jealousy for his people. And because his people had betrayed him, because they had strayed so far away from him, God was coming down. and He was going to come down in judgment upon them. And this message through Micah was that his people were rebellious and that none were following him, neither in the north or in the south. What had happened was that slowly and surely, the nation was leaving God. There was a wedge that was driven in between themselves and the Lord in their relationship, in their worship of their one true God. And this wedge kept driving further and further down, separating them from God, and it also ultimately separated them from each other. The nation was shattered into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom, and neither kingdom was really doing well spiritually. The leadership was taking advantage of the people. They were not enacting justice. We see this in chapter 3. This was something that was, was told to them. The prophets were speaking falsely. It all added up to a growing divide of not following the Lord. And the, the beginning of this chapter, in chapter 6, verses 3 to 5, here is this sad statement from the Lord that we see here on the slide. God was asking his people, what have I done to you? How have I I burdened you? I'm the one who brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. My people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, plotted and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. He's asking them this. What have I done? How have I burdened you? He reminded them he was the one who freed them from the bondage of slavery through Moses. He was the one who would not allow curses to fall upon them through the king of Moab, Balak's request. This was for the purpose that they would know the Lord in his righteousness towards them, but they had forgotten. They were now far away from the Lord. And that sin that was in their lives was a wedge, as I said, that was driving them farther away from God in their rebellion, in their sinfulness against God. Now, perhaps they were now experiencing some of those consequences, or perhaps some of Micah's pronouncements, along with the other prophets that God had sent to the people, perhaps those things were getting through. They wondered how to make things right, but what they didn't realize was that they had thoroughly broken their covenant relationship with God. It was thoroughly rotten. It was thoroughly broken. What they thought of their vertical relationship with God and how to be forgiven and how to have their sins atoned for was to do these religious actions. But these religious actions started to become devoid of any sort of meaning. It became devoid of any sort of obedience, and so it was kind of a papering over all the other things that they were doing to one another. And so if I did something to my fellow man, well, then I would just go to the temple, offer a sacrifice, and then that's it, without actually becoming reconciled, without actually making things right. And so God 
And Micah, through Micah, had this message for his people. What have I done to you? How have I burdened you? And the answer is that God hadn't, that God had always graciously led them and been for them. And now here is this injustice towards each other. And now here is this rebellion in following other gods. And yet they have this question, God, what do you want from me? What do you want from me? This is basically what they're asking in verses 6 and 7. And what we see here on the screen, so what should I do? Should I come and bow down before God? Should I come to him with these burnt offerings? Uh, should I come with these yearling calves that are basically burnt offerings for atonement? Should I come to him with thousands of rams which would have pointed to sin offerings? So basically they're saying, how much should I offer to take away my sin? How much should I offer to redeem myself, to, to pay for the atonement for the consequences of my sin? What does God want from me? Now, this may be the cry not only of God's people then, but also of us here and now. What do you want from me, God? How much more? I'm already doing X, Y, Z at church. So what else am I supposed to do? Now, God's people assumed they would always have God in their corner. But what they were doing was dragging God down to where they were and assuming that, oh, we're God's people, we're the uh, descendants of Abraham, we're descendants of Jacob, and so God is always for us, no matter what we do. We are always going to be God's people, and he's always got our backs. But they had forgotten the covenant promises. Deuteronomy chapter 28 to 30, there's all these promises that are made to the people, follow me and I will bless you. But if you don't follow me, I will curse you. Here are the consequences for not following me. But they had this assumption. And so here is this question of how to hide their sin, how to sweep it under the rug. If we just offer enough, if we just do this more and more extravagantly, then it kind of whitewashes over our sin but they're not taking care of the rottenness, all the rot that had, that had uh, formed underneath it. If you think of it this way, uh, if you think of, for example, rust on a car, you know, it starts to bubble over, it starts to really eat away at the metal on the car. And if you just took paint and you just painted over that, you're not actually dealing with the rust. It's still corroding underneath. It's still falling apart. But that's where these people were at. They're saying, so what can we do to just wipe it out just really quickly, but without taking care of all that was pitted, all that was rotting away? If we take a look at this screen again, if we take a look at this slide, uh, there's this also, it gets more and more extravagant uh, in verse 7. And the, the extravagant uh, thing that he starts asking for is also the most grotesque thing. So it gets more and more extravagant. Thousands of rams to take care of my sin. 10,000 rivers of olive oil. That was part of the, the sacrificial system as well that sim symbolized cleansing. But then he says, shall I offer my firstborn? You know, I'm so serious about getting rid of my sin. Should I, should I offer my firstborn as a sacrifice, the fruit of my body for my soul? You know, this outrageous uh, idea that the people actually had, that Micah was, was uh, speaking uh, as an example of what the people would say, was how that they actually appeased and worshipped other gods. This was a practice that had made its way into the nation of Israel's worship practices of other gods. They offered their sons and daughters in sacrifice. And now they would take that awful practice and offer their actual firstborn to make atonement for their rebellion to God, who would never ask that. They were looking for extravagant ways to make entry to be with God. But the most extravagant offering that they could give was their true faith worked out in true obedience. They were making all these extravagant claims, 
but the most that they could have done, the most extravagant offering that they should have given was their true faith worked out in obedience in their lives. So they asked this question, and it's not as if the Lord had withheld the answer. It's not as if that they didn't know already. It's not as if God had kept it hidden and they had to search and scratch for it and dig all over the place or, or take stabs in the night into darkness and try to find ways of pleasing God. It was known to them all along. Micah brought to the Lord's people what God wanted of them. And it was not empty religious practices, but living out their faithful obedience in their lives. This is what he's getting at here. What we see in verse 8 is that God desires a life of faithful obedience, faith-filled obedience. He says, He has already told you, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? What is God asking of you? It's not all those extravagant worship offerings, but this is what he wants. He wants to see faith worked out in your life. Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. This is what you need to live out. This is what you need to do. God had indeed told them. He had shown them. He spoke it to them. He made it known to them. He told them, this is the good way. Live in it. The good thing God had made known to them points to the ethic of their life before him. The ethics, the morality that God was placing before them as they lived in relationship with him. But it also referred to an excellent way of living before the Lord. This is the most excellent way. This is what good refers to. He has shown you, O oh mortal, what is good. So what is moral, what is ethical, what is right. But he has shown you also what is the most excellent way of living. This is the way of living that leads to thriving, that is the best for you. This was their requirement Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with their God, not some other God, with their God. Now, when we talk about justice, justice is kind of a hot topic word right now, hot button word, you know, and, and it's an important word for certain. But sometimes we get confused on this point, placing biblical justice, the justice of God, beside or underneath secular justice, and that would be wrong. Secular justice has its foundations from this transcendent truth that comes to us from God. The Bible reveals the justice of God and what it looks like. In the Bible, we see the justice of God that it teaches us that wealth isn't meant to be stored, isn't meant to be kept just for ourselves, but the challenge in the Bible is that everything we have we are stewards over. We don't own anything. Everything is God's. And if everything is God's, then we are to look to help the community of God, to help those around us. An example of this uh, in my own Bible readings as well has been the, the uh, law of not uh, harvesting right to the edges. If you were in agriculture at that time and you were growing crops, you wouldn't harvest all the way to the edges, but you would leave those edges for the poor, that they might come in and glean from that harvest, that they might get a harvest for themselves, to take care of themselves. It's not something where we're just supposed to white-knuckle, have a grip on everything just for ourselves, but the Bible teaches us that. That is biblical justice. We're confronted with the concept of equity in biblical justice. The law was not meant only for those in Israel but how to treat others outside of Israel as well. Don't cheat your fellow Israelite along with those that are also foreign to the nation of Israel as well. We are taught that we are responsible for one another. This is what we read in the Bible. We are challenged to take care of and have special attention of those marginalized and those who are poor. We believe in moral absolutes, in big T truth that we believe has been given to us, transcendent. It's not just some human-made laws, human-made justice, but 
It's God's justice revealed to us. And he says, he has shown you, he has told you, O man, what is good. To act justly, to live out the biblical justice that, that reveals God's heart, that reveals God's character. This is good. Not only that, God also made known to them loving mercy, love mercy. They are to love being merciful to one another. And this word mercy in Hebrew, hesed, is the Hebrew equivalent to the Greek word agape, which is the type of love that God has for us, that God shows us mercy. And because he shows us mercy, we can offer mercy to others. Because he doesn't give to us as we deserve, we can do that for others as well. We can withhold, even though they may not deserve our love and yet we are called to love they may not deserve our patience and yet we bestow patience we we deal patiently with people this is part of that good that god has shown to his people love mercy and lastly the the good thing that god told them was to walk humbly with their god their whole life was supposed to be marked by this humility before god that their life and lifestyle was to be of a humility before God, that they would walk humbly with their God. And so Micah, he's relaying to the people, this is what is required of you. Not all these sacrifices, not all these things to just paper over your sin because the root is all rotten. We need to get that root healed and right do justice, love mercy, walk humbly. This is not to say that they didn't need atonement, because we do. But when were they going to start living out their faith? It's a good question for us. We need atonement. We need Jesus. We need his sacrifice for us on the cross. But for those of us who are who've said that we put our faith in Jesus Christ. When are we going to live out our faith? An example of this, Jesus was calling out the Pharisees, the religious leaders of his day. They were following strictly the observances of the law, where they were tithing mint and rue and other herbs. And if you look at the slide here, Jesus calls them to task in Luke 11, verses 39 to 42. This second paragraph, halfway down, woe to you Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of these things, of these herbs, of what is required of them in terms of a traditional, in terms of a, a rote practice, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Jesus was calling on them because he's saying, you just do these things and they mean nothing. But where is your justice? Where is enacting God's justice in your life? You know, how, where is the faithful obedience? Where is loving God? And so the people in that time and the people of Micah's time, they're not living this out. And Micah gave their examples right back to them. He gives them their indictment and he gives them their verdict because he says, this was known to you. This is what God has made known clearly. God desires a life of faithful obedience, faith-filled obedience. You know this. But he held a mirror up to them and he said, but this is what is going on right now. The wealthy are getting wealthier they're scamming others in verses 10 and 11 what we see here listen the lord is calling look at this question that god asks am i still to forget so basically saying am i supposed to turn a blind eye to these treasures that you've that you've accumulated that are ill-gotten am i supposed to turn a blind eye to the way that you became wealthy it's accursed. Shall I turn a blind eye to someone with dishonest scales? Basically, cutting corners to make more money. A bag of false weights so that they have to maybe pay less. 
or make the person pay more. The wealthy were getting wealthier. They're scamming other people, and this is an indictment against them because this is unjust. He has already shown you, old man, what is good, and you're not doing it. You're scamming each other. You are acting unjustly towards one another. And for us in our day and age, are we taking shortcuts in our field to get ahead dishonestly? Now, the feeling might be that you have to in order to stick with the rest of your peers. And, you know, I'm just doing what everyone else is doing. I'm not, you know, going so far above and beyond cutting corners. But I'm just doing what everyone else is. But is it worth it in the big picture as we believe our Father in heaven has saved us, is rooting for us, is cheering us on, has sent to us the Holy Spirit to dwell in us and empower us to live that way? That's not thriving. That's not a life of obedience. That's not faith-filled. Now, neither am I saying to roll over and just take it, but we cannot be participants in that type of system. Micah's calling out people who are doing that. This is an indictment against his people. They are cheating. They are acting unjustly. And because of that, God gives to them, through Micah, the verdict. And so if we think of it like a court of law, here is the law. Live obediently. Live a faith-filled obedience. That's the law, but they've broken it. And so here's the proof, here's the indictments. Look at what you do. And now here's the verdict. As a result of this injustice, because of a lack of loving kindness, because of obviously a lack of humility before their God, here is this verdict that God was going to bring ruin to them through his own hand. They would know that it was from him. We see this in verses 13 to 16. God says that, you will do all these things and everything would be for naught. You will try to save and save and save, but you will not be able to save it because it will all go to the sword. It will be forcefully taken from you. You will try to eat, but you will not be satisfied. It will be like dust in your mouth. You will prepare oil from your oil groves, but you won't get to use it. You will prepare wine from your from your vines, but you will not be allowed to drink it. Those are signs of blessing, oil and wine, and you are not blessed. Everything will be for naught. He was going to bring them to ruin through his own hand. Now, we have to be careful to not just use this as a blanket statement of why people may be going through rough times. We cannot... Uh, assume to know that it is due to sin. So if you see someone going through a tough time, you say, oh, you know, I got that rule. I got, I got that from Micah. That person obviously is a sinner. The prophet was given this word. Micah was given this specific word, was given this reason of why they were going to come to ruin. Now, could we face devastation due to sin? Could we face ruin because of sin? I think so, as God works to move us towards repentance, as God works to get, get our attention, to wake us up. But unless you have a prophetic word, and unless you have examined it carefully, and unless you have had it confirmed, in no way should we ever try to assume that we have the right to call out disaster in someone else's life as sin. We have to be really careful of that. But here is this verdict on God's people. They were not blessed. The verdict was God would have to enact upon them the covenant curses, the covenant consequences. The last thing of this verdict is in verse 16 is the worst of them. He says, you know, you are just like, you follow the statutes, not of me, but of King Omri, the king who had spread the worship of false gods when he established Samaria in the northern kingdom. This was in 1 Kings chapter 16. He said, you follow his statutes, you follow his ways. You are also walking in the ways of Ahab. You do the work of his house. 
Ahab could arguably be considered one of the most spiritually bankrupt kings from the north. He and his wife Jezebel, because they were so unhappy with the messages of the prophets that God had sent to them, they murdered many of them during the time of Elijah. 1 Kings chapter 17 all the way to chapter 22, it, 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 uh, uh, it's a chronology of events that Ahab does. It's terrible. They led the people further away from the worship of God to the worship of the God that they followed, to Baal. And this is what God's indictment, this is the verdict that God has against them is because you follow those ways. Even though you are my people, you are following those ways. It's been revealed that they were living with injustice. It was revealed that they had a lack of loving kindness, a lack of gracious love to one another. It had been revealed that there was a lack of humbly walking with their God. They were not walking according to what God had shown them. And so they would pay for it. God's whole goal during this time is repentance. God's whole goal during this time is not because he takes joy in punishing, in meeting out discipline, and he gleefully puts them under his thumb, puts us under his thumb. That's not, that's not the goal. The goal is because he wants to restore them. He wants them to return, and out of his grace and mercy, he promises that they will return, not because of anything they do, not even because they come to their senses, but because God is gracious. He's the one who calls. He's the one who leads us to repentance. He's the one who mends the broken relationship. This is the heart of God that we see here in Micah. In this season of Lent, we are led in this same path that we have to look at our own lives, that we have to see that when we shortchange God, we shortchange others, and we have to see that God cares about others. His heart is for those who are vulnerable, those who are taken advantage of. He cares for what we often willfully turn a blind eye to. I saw this picture online uh, of uh, this photographer, Kevin Lee. And this uh, piece is called The Invisibility of Poverty. And here's this child, shabbily dressed, but just blending into the background. The poor blend into the background because we choose not to see. But that is not God's heart. This is just one example. He calls us into repentance of this. That this is not right, that we cannot, I mean, this, this, this art points out so much to us. But he calls us to repent of this, to return from this. God is the one who is transforming us and shaping us and convicting us of things like this. And our lack of caring may stem from the cooling off of our love for God, for our love and passion for Jesus Christ. I'd like to humbly submit that perhaps what we need this week is to make a list of what has become empty in our faith or to sit and to contemplate what has become empty in our faith practices. What have we assumed in our relationship with the Lord? Is it just, you know, I believe in Jesus and so now, you know, fire safety plan. I'm not going to hell. Perfect. And I'm just going to live my way. No, what we are called to do is God desires a life of faithful obedience. When we ask for forgiveness of God when we harm others, we are also called to do the hard work of making it right with others as well. That God is also asking of us that we would seek to 
make things right, to reconcile through Jesus with others. God desires a life of faithful obedience. Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly. In his grace, he continues to reveal to us our deep need of Jesus, our deep need of our Savior. We are just like the people of old. Out of one side of our mouth, we may say we believe, but then in our actual lives, when the rubber hits the road, are we living it out? In God's grace, we are revealed. We are laid bare. We are sinners still in need of God's grace, in need of our Savior Jesus. In response in the power of the Spirit, here we remember we are given resurrection power to live our lives in faithful obedience. So let's, let's explore more fully what this means for us. Let's explore more fully how we can live justly, how we can love mercy, how we can walk humbly. Not to earn salvation, but how we might live our lives because of our salvation. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's pray. God, we are challenged that uh, as a fickle uh, human, we forget so easily. And we are challenged that our faith would make a real difference in our day-to-day living. That we wouldn't live out an empty, rote, uh, robotic type of faith, but it would be alive that it would make a difference in our day-to-day life in the ways that we treat other people and the ways that we love others. And so God, have more of your way in us. We repent before you. We hear your call to return. Shape us. Transform us, Lord. We thank you for your forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, and actually, let's also continue to pray now uh, for our world. God, we, we pray uh, for continued protection. We thank you for the opening of our country, of our city, and we pray for wisdom. We pray for your continued protection over us. We continue to pray for peace in our world. We pray for places like Ukraine and Russia. We pray for places like the Tigray region. We pray for places like Syria, Afghanistan, and others other places that we've forgotten, but that are in turmoil. God, we pray for uh, our, uh, our denomination. We continue to pray for renewal. And we pray that for our church as well and for each and every one of us that would hear the deep call to follow you more fully, to love you more fully. But we need your deliverance from the evil one, Lord. We also bring to you our loved ones, knowing that you hear us, knowing that you hear our concerns over them. We pray for Trinity, for healing, and for Jean, for Jack W., for Sinead, George, Camille, for Jessica, Darylin, for Ellie, Pinky, for Ian, for Jim K., Paul B., Elizabeth W., for Sue W., for Helmut and Marilyn, Peggy, Roland, Liz S., and others that come to our minds at this time. You hear us, Lord, and we're so grateful. You love these children of yours, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We now gather at the Lord's table. The invitation is given that we don't come from our own rights, but we have been invited by Christ himself to feast in his presence, to feast at his table that he calls us to. Jesus said this, I am the bread of life. Those who come to me will never be hungry. Those who believe in me will never be thirsty. No one who comes to me will I drive away. And so we partake in this feast. We respond to him with our givings by giving to him a portion of all that he has given to us. If you are able to do so at this time, as the Spirit is leading you to, to give to the ministry of the church. And let's join now in singing the doxology.
Let's pray. God, we thank you for all the ways that you provide for us and for the ways that you have given us this privilege of of giving gifts and entrusting our lives to you to give to others through the church. We ask that you'd use these generous gifts from your people, that you would grow your kingdom here in us, through us. Help us to serve our neighborhood faithfully and help us to use these good gifts well. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus who taught us to pray and we recite together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. The Lord Jesus, on the night before he died, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
I invite you now to take your bread and to take a moment before the Lord. The body of Christ given for you. Let's eat together. In the same way, Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. I invite you to take this drink, to take a moment before the Lord. Here is the blood of Christ, the cup of the new covenant. Let's drink together. Every time we eat this bread, every time we drink the cup, we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Our God and eternal Father, we give you thanks for this mystery, this holy mystery that you have given yourself to us. It is by your sacrifice that you nourish us. And through your, uh, this, invisible sign of your, this visible sign of your invisible grace, we are humbled by everything you have done. We humble ourselves again before you. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's continue in worshiping our Lord by singing, by singing this next hymn, Love divine, all love's excelling, which reminds us that the quality of God's love overshadows all else. Even in the sin that we can identify with from the passage, we are reminded in this hymn of Jesus' compassion, and he is worthy of our praise. And so let's sing together.
I do uh, want to invite you to consider joining us for Grace Connections today at 11.45 a.m. It's a great time of just fellowship and just connecting with people that you may not have seen in a while that, have, uh, that do need to stay at home at this time. Uh, and so please do consider joining us. The link can be found on Facebook. It can also be found on the weekly email as well. Now let's take this blessing with us as we go out from this place. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen.